Good morning. Oh, no, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the second Chinese Studies Colloquium this semester. Today's event uh, is sponsored by the Chinese program in the School of Languages and Cultures at Purdue University. My name is Hong Jian Wang. I am an assistant professor of Chinese and Asian studies at Purdue. Today, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you our honored speaker, Professor Feng Gang Yang. Professor Yang is a professor of sociology and the founding director of the Center on Religion in the Global East at Purdue University. He's also the founding editor of the journal Review of Religion and Chinese Society and the recipient of multiple prestigious grants. Professor Yang has a vibrant and robust research program which focuses on the sociology of religion, religious change in China and immigrant religion in the United States. He's enviably prolific. He is the single author of three books, namely Atlas of Religion in China, uh, Social and Geographical Contexts, published in 2018 at Braille, Religion in China, Survival and Revival Under Communist Rule, published, published in 2012 at Oxford University Press, and Chinese Christians in America, Conversion, Assimilation, and Adhesive Identities, published in 1999 at Penn State University Press. He's also the co-editor of more than 10 books. Two of his articles, uh, journal articles, won major, no, won uh, distinguished uh, article awards. In addition to his numerous uh, invited talks and keynote speeches at major universities and professional associations across the globe, he's also keen on engaging the general public. His media interviews have appeared on the national public radio, New York Times, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, U.S. Today, Time, uh, The Economist, CNN, BBC, and so on. Professor Yang, thank you very much for accepting our invitation to talk about your latest research. Thank you also for sharing your insight on one of the most pressing issues in contemporary China related to human trafficking and abuse of mentally disturbed women that has recently stirred a public fury on China's social media. I also want to thank everyone here today for uh, joining us. As always, we will have about 40 to 45 minutes uh, of talk and the Q&A session right afterwards, uh, which lasts usually between 15 to 20 minutes. Um, so everyone, without further ado, please join me and welcome Professor Yang. Professor Yang, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Professor Wang, for this uh, introduction. Uh, it's really it's a great pleasure to be able to be uh, in this uh, Chinese studies colloquium and uh, to present something of uh, some of my studies. Um, let me uh, share my screen. Share screen. So hope you can see my screen okay. All right. Um, many of you may have learned about the case of the chained mother of eight children in Xuzhou prefecture of Jiangsu province. Almost two months have passed since the initial exposure of this case by a video blogger and Chinese social media have kept pressing on this particular case because it's too shocking for people to believe this could happen. And some international media have uh, covered some aspects of the story. For example, you can find the story uh, in the New York Times, Washington Post, uh, Wall Street Journal, uh, CNN, NPR, BBC. So for those who, are, who don't know much about this case, I suggest you uh, go to those major media platform to find out some of the details. I don't plan to go over any of the details of this case because some details are too disturbing to review. But I, uh, let me just uh, 
these are the key uh, photos, uh, the mother uh, and his, uh, her husband. And uh, people also try to uh, find out who is this woman. And there are a lot of uh, disagreements about who she is. And um, in addition to the case of the mother of eight children in Jiangsu province, recently there's another case of a caged woman in Shanxi province. Uh, this was uh, exposed first uh, uh, in late February, and then the prefecture uh, of Yulin uh, Police Bureau uh, made a statement about it on March 1st. These cruel and shocking cases have exposed problems in many layers, including the existence of human trafficking, and enslavement of women for bearing children, the cover up of local officials, the failure of existing laws to protect women, and the censorship of media. What can we do? What can we scholars do? Well, we have, we can do really very little to help in this particular case. But perhaps we can help to gain some better understanding of the social problems behind or underneath the case. Indeed, this and the similar cases are only a tip of the iceberg of broader social problems. So today I want to examine one of these problems the widespread imbalanced sex ratio or missing girls in China. As many of you may know, the normal, uh, the normal uh, natural sex ratio at birth is about 105 boys to 100 girls. But China has the world's most skewed sex ratio at birth, with about 116 boys than 100 girls in 2000, in the year 2000, uh, in the census of 2000, and then 120 in 2010, and 113 in 2020. So according to China's population census, there were 1.4 million more boys than girls born in the 1980s, 1.3 million, uh, 1.4 million. And then 10 million more in the 1990s, 13 million more in the 2000s, and the 12 million more in the 2010s. So in total, there are more than 30 to 35 million surplus men or boys. If you look at this chart, you can notice, you may notice that about 25 million of them are already in the marriable age. And another 10 million are entering the marriable age in this decade. This means that more than 30 million men will be bachelors because there are not enough women available for marriage. Put this in another way. Taiwan's total population is 24 million, and Hong Kong's total population is 7.5 million. When they combined, it's 31.5 million people in Taiwan and Hong Kong. There will be about the same number of bachelors 
in mainland China who do not, who there are not available women for marriage. And another way to think about this, the scale in the US, Texas is the second largest state with 29 million people. In China, the, the surplus men who cannot marry, there will be more of them than the total population of Texas. So what has happened that has led to such a huge number of surplus men? Scholars agree that there is a cultural reason, the traditional culture of some preference. Traditionally, male offspring are considered important for economic, social, and religious reasons. Economically, sons are an important source of manual, manual labor, labor in the agricultural context. Socially, sons are the primary pro providers of old age support for parents. And taking care of parents is their filial obligation. But most importantly, sons are preferred over daughters for religious reasons. Almost every Chinese may know what uh, Mengzi said. There are three kinds of unfilial piety. No descendant is the greatest. Only males are considered as descendants because traditionally only sons can continue the family name or lineage and perform ancestral veneration ceremonies. Daughters are to marry out, so they belong to some other's family. Of course, in modern times, much progress has been made in China about the equality between men and women, especially among the urban residents and the better educated people. And you may be familiar with Chairman Mao's famous slogan that women may hold up half the sky, or male and female equal work, equal pay. However, research has shown that some preference has persisted in China. It is also evident that parents with a strong some preference are more likely to neglect or mistreat daughters, such as providing shorter periods of breastfeeding, allocating smaller amount of food, or taking less care. All of this may lead to higher rates, higher rates of mortality, infant mortality of girls. Then within this context, enter the factor of one child policy. This has been a policy since the early 1980s. In urban areas, the one child policy is more strictly enforced, less so in rural areas. And also ethnic minorities uh, were allowed to have two children instead, instead of one. Uh, in some rural areas, if the firstborn is a girl, the couple may be allowed to have a second child, but it's not automatic. The couple may have to pursue it, the officials or bribe the officials to get the permission to have another pregnancy. Under the one child policy, in this culture of some preference, when a married couple can only have one child, it's better to be a son. If it is not a son, what would they do? They might either hide or abandon the baby girl so that they may get another chance 
of producing a song legally. Hiding was not rare. Hiding is reflected in urban in uh, in uh, in this underreporting. So every year, millions of infant girls are not registered in the household registration system in China. That's called a hukou. The unreported girls do not have hukou. It is said that in the Xuzhou prefecture, where the chained mother of eight is located, in the year 2000, the hukou registration has a sex ratio of 173 boys to 100 girls. Hukou is required for school, for employment, marriage, health care, and so on. So if someone does not have a hukou registration, she would lose many opportunities in life. Many girls don't have hukou. Besides hiding, abandoning is another way. Abandoning of infant girls is reflected in orphanages and overseas adoptions. Most of the orphans in China are girls. And the few boys usually have some congenital disease. According to the US State Department, American families adopted about 81,600 children from China from 1999 to 2018. And the vast majority of, the, of those are girls. Actually, the girls hidden or abandoned could be considered lucky ones in comparison with the others. In addition to this, there are sex selective abortion and female infanticide. Sex selective abortion has been identified by scholarly studies as a primary cause of the imbalanced sex ratio in this culture of some preference. That serves really, uh, the some preference serves as the underlining motivation, but the fact is, Many have this sex selective abortion. And technology may even help in this regard. The ultrasound equipment became widely available in China since 2000. Even though the government has banned prenatal sex detection, many couples find ways to detect and abort the pregnancy. And the one child policy, you may have heard that uh, it has changed. It changed to two children policy in 2015 and even changed to three children policy last year. Nonetheless, you, in order to register hukou, the married couple have to get permission to have a pregnancy in advance. So because of the serious shortage of marriable women, the phenomena of human trafficking of girls and young women for childbearing purpose has been prevalent, especially in the underdeveloped areas where few women are willing to marry someone there. You know, those women in those area may marry out and a few would come in. The poor families often had to resort to buying trafficked women in order to bear children and carry on the family name. The trafficked women might be sold even by their own parents. Like the father of the, uh, the caged uh, actually, the husband of the caged woman in Shanxi province. They had a boy and a girl, and the girl was sold to, the, uh, to a neighbor uh, village for 30,000 yuan. But more often, young women are lured than tricked 
all ab abducted by force and put into a situation that is extremely difficult to escape because the whole village would watch over and the local officials would protect the interests of the families rather than the enslaved women. Some female college students have gone missing too. They were abducted and sold to poor villages in deep mountains. In fact, there are two movies in China about the life of abducted women. One is called Mangshan, Blind Mountain. The other is called Jia Gei Da Shan De Nu Ren, The Woman Who Married the Mountain. As long as there are skewed sex ratios like this, the human trafficking and enslavement of women for child-bearing purpose will be difficult to prevent or to stop. Even if the laws becomes stricter and the punishments severe, culture is a powerful factor and it is very slow to change. So final, final thing is what is the connection between imbalanced sex ratios and religious geography as in the title of the talk? As a sociologist of re religion, I've collected data through surveys, interviews, and the fieldwork observations. It's about 10 years ago, someone showed me that China's economic census in 2000 included religious sites, churches, temples, and mosques. So uh, I began to learn uh, GIS. Geogra gra geographical uh, information system and to try to uh, map religions uh, in China. Uh, and as I learned mapping and my, my graduate student learned this and we had postdocs did some projects. So here, like first show you a map of this imbalanced sex ratio all over, all over throughout China. As you can see, this is uh, based on census 2000. And we use the sex ratio under age five at the county level, because by age five, there could be delayed household registration. And so this mitigates some of the hidden or abandoned uh, situation. And this shows in many, many counties, the sex ratio is larger than 116. That is, when there's 116 boys, there are 100 girls. Uh, uh, in many other areas, is 106 to 116. And the two areas, uh, one is uh, into the uh, right side uh, here. If we enlarge this uh, Feng County in Xuzhou Prefecture, it's one of the uh, higher rate uh, areas. The other case, the caged woman case, is in Jiaxian, uh, Jia County of Yulin Prefecture of Shanxi Province. Maybe the county is, uh, two, there are so many counties. So this is the prefecture level of map. Uh, as you can see, this is the Xuzhou area and this is the Yulin area prefecture. And though both, both places have higher rate of uh, the sex rates. And uh, these beautiful maps were made by my uh, graduate assistant, uh, Brian McPhail. Uh, that's uh, this one just quickly for the census 2010. The problem of uh, imbalanced sex ratio persisted. It's uh, still a lot throughout the country. So this is so widely spread 
and there's a shortage of women and uh, as the root problem of the, uh, the recent cases. Then after we got the data of uh, religious sites uh, by uh, all provided by the China's uh, census, uh, census Bureau, Statistics Bureau as economic census. And we worked uh, for really uh, almost 10 years, eight years, six to eight years. Uh, eventually, uh, you know, I was very happy to have this type of religious data. So as a sociologist, we are always looking for data and this is, became available. And in 2018, uh, we uh, produced a book, uh, The Atlas of Religion in China. And uh, it's a big book and uh, try to uh, describe uh, religions, the major religions and some other religious phenomena. Uh, so I put this in my theoretical framework, framework of three religious markets, the legally allowed religions uh, in the red market and those officially banned religions, they still persist. So they are in the black market. Then there's uh, many uh, religious activities and places uh, in the gray market because their legal status is unclear, is ambiguous. Uh, so the red market include the five religions that officially allowed and approved. And, but each of the five religions also have some uh, activities or groups uh, underground. So in the black market or in the gray market. Then there are other cults. So there are Confucianism, Maoism, and a folk religion. So this is the book we produced. And uh, you know, we mapped the religious sites, the uh, Buddhist temples, throughout China, where are they located? So the uh, yellow ones are the Han Buddhist temples, the uh, purple uh, maroon colored sites are the Tibetan Buddhist temples. In the Tibetan area, uh, Sichuan, Qinghai, Mongolia, Inner Mongolia, and some in Xinjiang. And these are the mosques throughout China, not only in Western part of China, but also in uh, Northwest here in central China, uh, many mosques throughout China. These are the Protestant churches, uh, heavily concentrated on the coastal areas, but also in the Yellow River, Huai River uh, region and Northeast. China. These are the Taoist temples, two kinds of Taoist temples. Uh, they're spread out in uh, most of China. And these are the Catholic churches. Uh, as you can see, they are also very widely spread. These are the officially approved religious sites. We also find some Confucius temples and the schools uh, that have been restored, become active in recent decades. Uh, Confucianism is not considered a religion in China according to the religious policy, but it functions uh, religiously. So we also mapped them uh, on this. And then at the county level, which religion has more sites. Uh, this map shows the predominant religion uh, by the number of sites in uh, each of the county. As you can see uh, in Xinjiang, there are, it's a mosque. Uh, Islam is predominant. In Western China, uh, Buddhism, Buddhist temples are the predominant ones. But in some counties, uh, Protestant churches uh, more than any of the other religions. There are also some counties with more Taoist temples 
And some counties have more Catholic churches than the science of other religions. In this Atlas book, we also go through each province, like Jiangsu province, where the chained mother of eight is found, is found. Actually, it's found in the northern, northeast, northwestern part of Jiangsu province. And we uh, analyzed the, the census, population census, and I singled out the educational level has clear change in that decade from 2000 to, 2000, uh, to 2010. So uh, education improved significantly, but especially for Southern Jiangsu, but not so in Northern Jiangsu. And we mapped the religious science in Jiangsu province. And uh, there are a lot of uh, Protestant churches in Jiangsu province. Uh, actually 64, 65% of all religious sites are Protestant churches. But in Xuzhou, uh, south of Xuzhou, there are many Christian churches, but not the other uh, part of Xuzhou. Uh, in Fengxian, there are also uh, Christian churches, uh, but uh, Christians are still a small minority in the overall population. I uh, hope this um, do provide some context to understand the cultural environment there. And uh, here, particularly uh, Xuzhou, here we do see uh, quite some churches, but again, this is in southern part of Xuzhou. Another province, uh, the caged woman is found in Shanxi province. And uh, in Shanxi, the population change from, 20, uh, from 2000 to 2010 is uh, the rapid increase of one generation households. That is no children, right? one generation households increased quickly. Here's the religion. Uh, it's uh, very concentrated. Uh, Yulin is, uh, where is Yulin? Northern here, Northern Shanxi is Yulin Prefecture. Uh, Yulin has a lot of Taoist temples or folk religious and some Buddhist, very few Christ Protestant churches. Uh, uh, just, uh, this is Xinjiang. Xinjiang that may be in the media for many uh, reasons. Uh, and Xinjiang, the most important demographic change that I, I find, we find is this ra rapid urbanization between 2000 and 2010. And the Xinjiang religious distribution, as you can see, 99% of religious sites in Xinjiang are mosques, Muslim mosques. But you do see some Protestant churches, some Buddhist temples, especially in northern part of Xinjiang. And, um, okay. Okay, so besides the Atlas book, actually the Atlas book was uh, an expensive book. So, uh, I have used uh, some of the grant fund and made it uh, open access. So now it's a free, everyone can read or download the whole book. And the book include many colorful maps and some beautiful photos. So uh, I encourage everyone to uh, take a look. I'll give you the website of that uh, Atlas book. Besides the Atlas book, we also have online mapping. So this is in the, uh, our uh, center's website, uh, globaleast.org. Uh, and actually you can go there and uh, see uh, in different ways of this uh, uh, different maps. 
And finally, let me introduce uh, this article that my uh, co-authored with my former uh, PhD student and also my colleague. Um, and uh, the student is Yunping Tong, Dr. Tong now. And <laughs> She works at the Pew Research Center now, and uh, she did the dissertation on religious geography and the county level sex ratios in China. And uh, my colleague, uh, Sina, also helped a lot. Um, okay, let me uh, see what should I say about the article. Okay. Sex ratios at birth uh, varies, as you can see, varied uh, across, uh, varied wi widely across different counties or prefectures. And the regional variations cannot be fully explained by economic development or other factors. As you think about it, the sound preference culture and sex selective abortion, the two things, are all closely related to religion or relate to different religions in different ways. For example, Christians and Muslims traditionally oppose abortion, but Buddhism and Taoism do not have clear doctrines on this, on abortion. And also religion is not only personal beliefs and practices or affect the families. The presence, the presence of religious value in an area could have influence in the local area. So we uh, did this uh, statistical analysis, statistical modeling with this uh, hypothesis, we tested the hypothesis that sex ratios in counties with a greater presence of Buddhism or Taoism are probably more male bias and less so in counties with greater presence of Christian churches and Islamic mosques. Uh, in the statistical analysis, we used child sex ratio for children under age five, as I shown you uh, the two maps or the four maps, because rather than using one year, uh, the birth year, but five year, uh, this uh, we think it helps to mitigate some of the problems of underreporting of girls at uh, birth or hiding or abandoning. The control variables uh, also include those economic development, GDP, urbanization, migration, and also ethnic composition. And we actually, the uh, one child policy varies. Again, in the mostly rural areas, it could be considered 1.5 policy. Uh, rather than one child policy, because a second child is possible if the first born is a girl. Anyway, taking all of these factors into consideration, and uh, here are the major findings. Okay, different models. Here, maybe focus on the last model that take the control variables into consideration and also the spatial effect you know, neighbors influence neighbors. Uh, if we take that also into consideration, the findings is this. Only Taoism, the presence of a Taoist temple increases the imbalanced sex ratio. But the Buddhist temples and Islamic mosques tend to lead less imbalanced sex ratio. And the Christian churches have no significant 
uh, association uh, with the sex ratio. Um, okay, so let me uh, see what uh, any other thing I want to say. I think that's clear. Of course, this is a uh, kind of uh, ex uh, exploratory research. Nobody has done this kind of study. We just tried and find religion is a significant factor, uh, uh, is associated with uh, uh, sex ratios at the county level, and also at the prefecture level, higher uh, geographic area level. Uh, and uh, one thing I think need to highlight is the effect of the size of the religious presence on sex ratio is, is quite significant, is even greater than the economic effect. You know, economically more developed areas tend to have less imbalanced sex ratio. But when you have a presence of Taoist temples, a 10% increase in the number of Taoist temples per 100,000 people in a county is associated with an increase of the sex ratio of 0.41. But a 10% increase in GDP per capita is expect to lower the sex ratio only by 0.11. So the religious effect is bigger than the, sex, uh, the economic uh, effect. Oops. Um, so uh, in conclusion, the case of the Chen mother of eight is only a, sim a symptom of bigger social problems there are similar cases, and these uh, have been exposed or reported by uh, media or literature or in movies. These cases have revealed many layers of problems, and the one child policy consequences is only one of them. But missing girls is a widespread phenomenon in China. And we may trace this particular problem to other root reasons. And we looked at the religious aspect of it. We, you know, we cannot help much, hope this uh, sociological study help people have some better understanding of the broader social issues. Thank you. Uh, I'll stop here Yang. and yeah, I'll stop here and uh, uh, open for questions. Um, yeah. If you have questions, you can raise your hand or you can type in the chat box. Either way. Yes. I have a question here. Hey, Feng Gong, it's Brian. Thanks for that uh, interesting talk. I, uh, I I was curious to hear um, a, a little bit more about uh, the intersection between um, the presence of religious sites and uh, the the probably about lack of a better way of putting it the, de the devotion of the people in the. Um, uh, in the county. Uh, so is, uh, did you run any models where you looked at their intersection in terms of, you know, whether it be an interaction term or, um, you know, how, how it might come together where there's, there's maybe an intensification if you've got, you know, real people who are scoring high, really high on religiosity in the context of the presence of these religious sites? Yeah, thank you, Brian. Uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, of course, a very good question. And the problem is we do not have the individual level data. Uh, in China, there are so few surveys uh, asking individuals about their religion. And, and it's not possible to know which counties uh, those cases come from. 
so that we were not able to do the, the interactive effect analysis. And hopefully in the future, uh, there will be possibility of doing that. Yes, I'm Professor Xie. Hello. Yeah. Hi, so, um, hello. So, so, how do you explain what is it? What is it in the content of the religion that that encourages uh, these tendencies? What is it about Taoism that says that well, they're going to have more, uh, more, more males? Yeah. Thank you, Dan, for the question. Uh, for you know. Beyond the empirical evidence, we can only rely on some perhaps interviews, some other studies. And uh, the some preference is clearly in the traditional culture. And, and that's more closely associated with Confucianism. But unfortunately, Confucianism is not considered a religion in China by the official uh, policy. So even though we have a map of Confucius temples, um, there are too few to make any statistical analysis for this purpose. But we can say that uh, Confucianism and Taoism are the traditional Chinese religion. Right? They, they are more uh, close to each other. So in terms of the... Uh, family uh, ethics, uh, perhaps uh, Taoism has more of the Confucian uh, ethics than the other religions. You know, the other religions, all, all the others, Buddhism, Islam, and Christianity are so-called foreign religions that right? came from other countries, but the Taoism and Confucianism are the uh, Chinese traditions. So this could be, you know, because Taoism, or another thing, many of the Taoist temples are very difficult to uh, distinguish from folk religion. And as we know, folk religion, uh, or folk religions, plural, uh, very much carry on Confucian ethics. Uh, so this some preference is perhaps more encouraged uh, by Taoism or by folk religion. So that's why statistically they show up as a significant factor. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Actually, it's interesting that we find no statistical significance of Christian churches, uh, the presence of Christian churches at the county level. Uh, we speculated uh, that uh, Christian churches are still too few to have any significant impact. And also, uh, if you visit China, for people visit China, and your host, uh, if they want to take you out for sightseeing, most likely they would, you would have a chance uh, to visit some Buddhist temples, uh, Taoist temples. It's rare to see Christian churches. So the visibility of Christian churches in the communities are still uh, limited. Um, but there may be other reasons. Actually, we do uh, in, uh, in a book I edited that uh, came out last year that included a case of uh, Christian, uh, actually a house church, Christian church, and their reaction to the single child policy, abortion, and the new two children policy. And during the strict one child policy period, actually the, that Christian church, uh, the pastor also strongly encouraged the believers to follow the policy. It's okay to uh, only keep one child. 
And uh, that's one thing we find. That's uh, based on field work. It's interesting. Uh, the second thing I can recall that's is uh, they reacted to the two children policy more enthusiastically. You may have heard that uh, after 2015, not many young couples actually want a second child. But at this uh, Christian church, there are more people immediately got the second child. So, but that's, you know, it's such as, it's one church, it's one field work, we cannot generalize to the national level. But uh, uh, case studies or field work research, uh, also we began to show uh, some findings relevant to this topic. Professor Yang, we have one question in the chat box and one more hand. Uh, Two more hands, actually. Okay, so the question, do the increase of the amount of Christian size reduce the data in the county level of the imbalance of sex ratios? Actually, I already uh, answered. Uh, we, don't, we didn't find any statistical significance of the presence of Christian churches uh, relative to uh, sex ratio at the county level. Okay. All right, so I asked my question. My question is a, a kind of curiosity question. So when this um, chain woman incident became public um, in China, I was struck by the, by the reaction. Um, and the way I refer to it um, was like, it's almost like it was civilizational shock. So my question is, it, it, and this is probably not the right way to put it, but this is the way I assessed it. And so I'll put this in quotation marks, why the overreaction? Um, I mean, it's not, it's not as if, you know, China or anywhere else wouldn't have incidences where something like this could, could occur, but people seem like it was like almost unbelievable. Is it, is it because of the modernization or a shift in cultural values or what? I mean, it was this like this palpable sense of a civilizational shock um, that, that one got from social media and, and China. So I was just curious as to why was that the case? I mean, it seemed disproportionate to that anecdote anecdotal, unfortunate anecdotal incident? Um, it's interesting you put in that way. Uh, it's true, I wouldn't call this overreaction. It's, this case is uh, the level of cruelty has reached a unbelievable level to many people, even though human trafficking, enslavement of women for childbearing purpose uh, is not shocking, but the case itself, the cruelty is shocking. Um, and another reason is uh, internet is censored heavily uh, for other topics. But for this one, I wonder whether even those who actually doing the censorship work also find intolerable. <laughs> so they may not uh, really enforce the censorship. That's, then you let so many uh, postings uh, uh, talking about different aspects, different anecdotes of this particular case. So, and it's also, you know, it's uh, before, right, four days before the Chinese New Year's and followed by the Winter Olympic Games then the, the war in Ukraine. So those other issues, perhaps the censorship is more strict, trying to keep a tight control. Here is a social issue, social problem. And also many people really, you know, it's hard to see many of the photos. It's hard to think uh, how could that, that happen uh, to that extreme. So there are some, it reflect uh, what you can say and do through social media. I think there should be some uh, scholarly research on social media response to this particular case. There may be something interesting to find out. Um, hello, uh, thank you for the talk. This is really uh, an interesting topic to see that impact to uh, 
the, the gender uh, imbalances in, in China. Um, I saw the data you collected uh, for this study is based on the 2010 and tw uh, 2020, 2020, 2010 census. But um, yeah, I think uh, the mass growth of religious sites is uh, starting uh, at late 70s and early uh, 80s that uh, starting with the reform and open uh, in China. So I was wondering if uh, before that, during the Cultural Revolution and earlier period that uh, with less uh, religious uh, practices and, and sites uh, exist in China, that is this, uh, like this, the gender imbalance is still uh, existing or um, is it like comparison between and, and after the, the reform and open period is, is the religious size massive growth would really impact this imbalances? Is it, is it clear for you? <laughs> uh, well, uh, yeah, you know, there are both of the uh, uh, population policy, population control policy and religious policy have changed a lot during the Cultural Revolution, before the economic reforms in the 1970s, that began in the late of 1970s. So before that, actually all religious sites were closed. No single temple, church or mosque was open for religious service. It was banned, religion was banned for 13 years between 1966 and 1979. Only uh, in 79, churches, temples, and mosques were allowed to reopen. Then for the first 10 years or 20 years, they rapid reopen. So many old sites reopen, and then also some new ones were uh, uh, developed. And the data uh, of the religious sites I use actually as in 2004, China did a economic census. That is any uh, unit that has economic activities, you have employment, then they counted uh, and they counted all those economic units. So religion is included uh, in this uh, census. And that's the best available data of religious science you can get from China. And China is still very hard to do social service. When you ask religion, then you cannot do the survey at all. <laughs> and of course, there are some surveys have done some, uh, include some religion questions, but uh, usually the quality is, uh, is hard to tell. Uh, then I used uh, population census information of 2000 and 2010. And that's around the time of the economic census. So we can see that's the closest time. Uh, it's one shot uh, of analysis. Uh, the data itself uh, is hard to tell the recent development uh, because uh, after the 2004 economic census, uh, uh, China did another economic census in 2008, another in 2012, I think, but those, they changed definition so that most of the religious sites were not included in later economic census. So become useless. So this 2004 economic census has become a unique uh, set of data that allow us to do some analysis. <laughs> so uh, getting data is one of the most challenging uh, tasks uh, for doing research on China, especially on religion in China. I hope that answers your question. The recent change, yeah, we, we are watching, we are following, but hard to put them in quantitative analysis because of a shortage of data. Okay. First, we have one more question in the chat. Okay. So the result sounds somewhat related to family and life ethics. 
then how do we interpret the difference and the similarity between Buddhism and Islam teaching in terms of family and life ethics? We didn't really speculate much in the article itself or in the dissertation much uh, because that's beyond the empirical thing. Um, uh, of course, we, uh, you know, with other studies, we can explore further or even uh, speculate more on this. Um, I, I wouldn't say similarities uh, between Buddhism and Islam uh, in teaching. Uh, it's not the, the same mechanism. Uh, actually, uh, my another PhD student uh, who produced the beautiful maps uh, of uh, the sex ratio among children, uh, he is working using this uh, religious science data and uh, to see the relationship with health, health behavior and health result at the county level and at the prefecture level. Also some interesting findings. With these two dissertation studies, I wonder whether Buddhism and Islam, their statistical significance in, you know, no matter what direction, I wonder how much that has to do with ethnic policy rather than religion itself. Because as I showed you in some of the maps in Northwest China, uh, there are uh, a lot of mosques in Southwest China, there are a lot of Buddhist temples. It happens that in Northwest China, there are the Muslim ethnic minority, right? Uyghurs, Hui, and uh, several other ethnic minorities that are traditionally uh, Muslims. In southwestern China, Tibetan Buddhists, Tibetans. So, in terms of uh, population control policy, as I mentioned, you know, ethnic minorities could have two children or even more. Uh, but uh, the one child policy is more strictly imposed on high majority people, especially those in the urban areas, rural areas, the policy is also slightly different. So the, the statistical difference of Buddhism or similarities of Buddhism and Islam in this case, I wonder whether actually is a reflection, indirect reflection of ethnic population policy difference. In other words, ethnic minorities who are Tibetan Buddhists, not only ethnic Tibetans, but following Buddhism or Tibetan Buddhism and ethnic minorities who follow Islam may have, may show difference, not so much because of the religion, but because of ethnic uh, policy difference. Of course, this again, uh, we are staying at the speculative level, not empirical evidence uh, and our modeling. Thank you so much, Professor Yang. It was a very illuminating talk. And thank you very everyone for coming and for the thought-provoking questions. So uh, I think this concludes our um, colloquium today. Uh, and then stay tuned and see our future announcements for future talks. And then welcome back. Thank you. Thank you.